what is BRD? BRD is business requirement document. BRD describes the high level business requirement that client wants. I think of it more of client's wish list. All the things they want, it will be in BRD. What is FRD? So FRD is functional requirement document. It is mainly a technical document. It states the functionality required in the application design. To give you better understanding, let me bring up this page and let me try to explain it. Purpose of this tutorial, I'm going to Expedia.com. So on this page, as you can see, there's the Expedia logo here, then Expedia logo and text. And then you see all these different functionalities, right? All these functionalities are mentioned in FRD. For Expedia, the FRD is going to be huge. They have so much going on here, right? But just to give you guys a better understanding, all these links, buttons, text box, you see, all of these are mentioned in FRD. And they're mentioned in very detail. Some FRDs I have seen, they even mention the font size, font design, a padding, and so on. What is SDLC? Or tell me about SDLC. I'm going to answer this question in two different ways. First is easy way. Second is to impress the interviewer. First easy way. This is following the waterfall methodology. SDLC stands for software development lifecycle. First stage is requirement analysis, where in this stage requirements are being analyzed. Then it goes to a design step. Then it goes to coding or programming. Then it comes to testing. And after testing is done, it goes to release or production. To answer this question, that suffice the answer. But I would recommend you to use the longer version. The second approach I'm going to cover right now. This is following Agile methodology. SDLC stands for Software Development Lifecycle. Business analysts meet with the client and gather detailed business requirement. Business analyst then uses the business requirement to create BRD and FRD. Then these documents are sent to design team or UX team. Then all these documents are sent to developers and QA. Developers start writing code and QA, we analyze the documents and create test plan and test cases. Let's say, for example, developers will build the software in 10 different builds. When they are done coding the first build, they will send it to us and we will test the first build to verify if there are any issues. If we find any issue, we use bug tracking tool to add the issue. Developers then looks into the first build and fix the issue and send it back to QA. We retest the first build and do regression test to make sure that developers did not break any other part around the reported functionality. And this is how we test the rest of the builds. When it passed our acceptance criteria, we provide sign off. Software then goes through UAT. If customer is satisfied with our software, it goes for production and we provide maintenance after that. What is SDLC? Do not get confused thinking SDLC is one step process. Whenever you see a life cycle, think of the topic as process where it starts from the beginning to end. For example, SDLC, STLC, bug life cycle. SDLC stands for software testing life cycle. SDLC helps to run the testing process in a systematic and planned manner. CLC phases do not have to run in order. Some phases can run in parallel. Saying that some phases need to be completed before moving to the next. For example, in order to start test planning, a requirement analysis need to be done first. Test planning, test case development can be done parallelly. Before test execution, environment setup needs to be taken care of and uh, test cycle closure or end reporting part for that test execution needs to be done first. So STLC consists of requirement analysis, test planning, test case development, environment setup, test execution, and test cycle closure and reporting.
let's talk about each phases in detail in requirement analysis phase qa team analyzes the documents requirements it could be brd frd uh, design documents uh, different mocks whatever uh, the documents are available qa team will analyze it and qa team might have uh, different meetings with different stakeholders such as ba a product team product manager development team to understand certain requirements sometimes requirements are not written well and um, in this phase beside analyzing the documents qa team reach out to different team members to understand the requirements second phase is test planning usually qa manager or qa lead will prefer the test plan and test strategy documents in test planning stage these documents will be created by qa lead or qa manager next phase is uh, test case development in this phase a qa team writes test cases if automation is involved the automation test cases will be created as well usually uh, peers uh, verify each other's uh, test cases or qa lead will verify that next phase is environment setup this is actually done while test planning, test case development is happening. Same time, developers probably developing their code or script. The goal is that before test execution, environment should be ready. So you can think of while test planning and test case development is going on, also developers are writing their code. By then, it should be ready. Also, developers need to deploy that code code to some environment. For example, they're probably tested in their development environment or then it needs to move into QA environment. Preferably, environment should be up as soon as possible. So when developers have their codes ready for testing, it should be deployed to that test environment or they can test it on their own environment. Next phase is test execution. Basically, here testers going to test based on the test cases they wrote or if you're following Scrum methodology, that case, you really don't have to write test cases because the user's story itself is test case. So in test execution, you follow those requirements. You might look into designs, other documents to make sense and then make sure that what is defined, whatever the customer or product owner wanted the software to be, it matches with the documents and actual software or application. Next phase is test cycle closure reporting. In this phase, all reported bugs should be fixed. There should be some kind of matrix for this. For example, how we know when to stop testing or when should we deploy the code to production. General rule is that 95% of the code should be bug free and there should not be any major bug or a serious bug or any blockers. Minor bugs are okay, knowing the risk and that has to be approved by the team or management. And then QA provides sign off. And that's STLC in a nutshell. What is a test plan? And what does a test plan include? Test plan is a detailed document describing the scope, approach, resources, schedule of intended testing activities. It's talking about the resources, you know, how many QA tester we need, what kind of tool uh, the project needs. What does a test plan include? A test plan includes introduction, scope, approach, overview, different types of testing that will be carried out, what software and hardware will be required, issues, risks, assumptions, feature to be tested, feature not to be tested, and sign off. So here I'm going to explain what is a test case and how to write test cases. So test case is a series of steps a tester perform in order to test an application to find out what is the actual and expected behavior. Or simply you can say a test case is a document that describes step-by-step -step process how to test the application. We know the definition of test case. Now let's write some test cases. The test case development should be in very detail. For this tutorial, I'm going to use YouTube login page. Again, I do not work for YouTube or I'm not promoting this website. The purpose of this tutorial, I'm using this site as an example. On your browser, when you type www.youtube.com, sign in, 
this page should display. And then we have to log in using our credentials and it should go to the next page. When testers write test cases, the application is being developed. So we write test cases from BRD, FRD, mockups, or any other documents that are available. But for our tutorial purposes, we have this website already built, so it's much easier. So I have developed a format and uh, wrote some test cases. I'm just going to explain to you guys step by step how I wrote them. So let me go back to the uh, test case. So I'm using uh, OpenOffice. You can use Excel, Microsoft Word, write your test cases. If you're writing test cases in ALM, TFS, you might have additional steps. For example, test case ID, you might have requirement ID, test case ID. It could be uh, instead of description, it could be summary. Then you might need to add steps and so on. This is the basic format. And I have used this format in many companies, starting from startups, uh, mid-sized companies, Fortune 500, 100 companies, and it is okay. And many companies, they do have their format. You follow that. For learning purposes, this simple format is very effective and really easy to understand. If you can grab this and it doesn't really matter what format you're using, you should be able to write effective test cases. So here, the first test case I wrote. So let me briefly explain what I have here. So I have a test case ID, description or actions, expected results, actual results, pass fail. Again, we're not going to write actual results and pass fail until we execute the test case or as I was mentioning earlier, when you were writing test cases, the software is being developed. So when we execute the test cases, then we'll have the result here on actual results. Based on that, we'll pass or fail. Second test case, enter www.youtube.com login and validate login page. Expect a result, YouTube login page should display. So let me bring up the page again. Let me explain a few things here. So this is the page, right? So we have, so when you are on the page, you have this logo here, Google logo. And as you can see, G is uppercase and fonts are in different colors. It's a top of the page and is centered. Then you have one account, all of Google tag or text, whatever you call it. Then you have sign in to continue to youtube text then we have this uh, background here this section which has a profile icon then you have text box then you have a next button then you have a find my account link then create my account link then you have this text here one google account for everything google and then you have all these logos so we have to uh, write test cases for all of this and we can possibly write hundreds of test cases here so i'm going to write some test cases uh, for this tutorial we're not going to able write all the test cases here so let me go back to my uh, document the third test case i said verify login page functionalities and expect a result login page should have following functionalities number one google logo two one account all of Google tag, whatever I just explained to you guys, I captured those here. And then fourth, I mentioned verify Google logo functionalities, expected result Google logo should display top of the page and it should be centered. And then I explained uh, how it should be spelled, the G should be uppercase, and I mentioned the color of the fonts and so on. And then the next, section is uh, the one account all of google tag and we have to follow the same procedure for all all of the functionalities present in that page so when my test cases pass i can say as expected or i can write more details then i'm going to pass it or fail it so in this case i was able to open a browser so i say pass so we can follow the same process for the rest of the test cases right so that's that's more of test execution right but for uh, writing test cases uh, just get a mindset that you have to write them in very detail and that 
this is the document from all the documents you're going to write these test cases and you're going to follow this document throughout testing the application so this is more of a, like a final document we are creating so we can test and it's just not that one tester will test it there might be multiple tester you know and they should able to pick up your test cases and make sense out of it they should able to test the application sql and databases first i'm going to go over database basics then i'm going to go over the differences between relational database and non-relational database then i'm going to go over what is a sql and some basic commands then i'm going to show you how to install and manage a relational database then i'm going to show you how to insert data in the database and run some basic queries what is a database let's head to google and google for what is a database we we'll scroll down there's a link from oracle.com they are one of the oldest company out there who've been providing solution for databases so if you look at the definition here a database is an organized collection of structured information or data typically stored electronically in a computer system a database is usually controlled by a database management system dbms together the data and the dbms along with the applications that are associated with them are referred to as a database system often shortened to just database data within the most common types of databases in operation today is typically modeled in rows and columns in a series of tables to make processing and data coring efficient the data can then be easily accessed managed modified updated controlled and organized most databases use structured query language sql for writing and coring data to simplify what i just read think of databases as a system where you can store your data retrieve data modify data update and so on and the tool you used to do all these things is sql which is known as structured query language types of databases there are mainly two types of databases relational or sequence databases also known as rdbms second type is non-relational database or non-sequence databases also known as nosql databases relational database management system uses schema which is the skeleton structure that represents the logical view of the entire database in relational database you can store the data in tables that consist of columns and rows every row represents an individual record and a column stands for a field with a data type assigned to it tables that contain related information can be linked with primary and foreign keys some examples of sql databases such as oracle postgresql mysql sql server the names kind of hint that they are sql databases in recent years non-relational databases became very popular the main reason is the growing need for unstructured data storage or you might hear the buzzword big data think of how much raw unstructured data each of us consuming each day our social media feeds phones and so on this data is being stored somewhere relational or sql databases are not built for search large amount of data that's where the non-relational or no sql databases comes in they do not support sql queries non-relational databases are good for unstructured data instead of tables with columns and rows they have collections of different categories these collections are illustrated by documents a document can have a name address and product in a collection same time another document can have just a name and product in the same collection there is no particular schema to these documents different collections might not have any relations among them there are many different types of non-relational databases here are some document oriented databases such as mongodb and couchbase key value databases such as amazon dynamodb and redis 
graph databases such as Neo4j. Now, what is SQL? It is a domain specific language designed for managing data held in a relational database management system. Think of it like this you work in a warehouse, you have pallets or cases of water bottles. You need to use a pallet jack or some kind of tool to put the water bottles on the correct shelf. Here, shelf is the database, water bottles are the data and pallet jack or the tool you used is sql now i'm going to head over to w3 school you can google for w3 schools this is a great site for learning sql html javascript css there's so many resources i really like this site and over the years i've been using it so here select learn sql i'm not going to go over in details here but i just want to kind of give you the resource and show you how to use it and here again the definition is here if you go to intro it will give you more details about sql the cool thing about this site is that actually you can practice your sql course here so here there are many things to look at but for beginners i, I don't want you to be overwhelmed so i want you can look into select where and or not order by insert into update delete select top mean and max count average sum like wildcards joints all the joints here in a join left join joints in general i mean as a keyword that's what you're probably going to be using most of the time anyways there are other topics here here you can look into sql primary key foreign key i will go over some of these comments when i set up and show you guys how to run queries but i'm not going to go over all of them moving on now we're going to install and play around with a relation on database called sqlite it is a very popular open source database which is cross platform compatible it boasts that it is the most used database engine in the world sqlite is serverless database engine what that means is that you don't need to manage any servers and no configuration needed. So I'm going back to Google and I'm going to search for SQLite database. Click on the first one. This is the official site here and then click on download. And from here you select what operating system you're using. So these are for Android, these are for mobile OS. As I mentioned, it is cross platform comfortable so you can use it for mobile os as well so mostly you'll be using either linux or windows or mac so depending on your os sqlite might be pre-installed such as mac os not in windows though you will need to install it to check if you have it already installed you can simply open the terminal i'm going to open my terminal and make it larger so you can see it type sqlite 3 i know i'm kind of saying sqlite but it spells yeah that's just the way it is right so here if you see something similar connected to transit in memory database then it shows you the sqlite version that means you already have it installed so mostly mac or some of the linux distros you can check and make sure that you have it for windows i already have it installed just to show you guys if you're using windows just to walk you through so windows platform here okay binary is for windows right here so if you have a 32 bit system get this one if you have 62 bit so i'm going to go with the 62 bit for now then you just download it right just go to your download and uh so let me download it Still, I'm gonna download SQLite. So for Windows, right? What are you going to do? It's going to be in a zip format. So you'll need to unzip it. So you'll go here and right click. And here is asking me to compress. Of course, I don't want to compress it, but but you'll see option saying unzip it. So right click and unzip it. It will ask you to if you were not in the C directory, you'll need to create a folder. Or go to your c directory and create a folder called sqlite so you'll go to your you can either go to your computer 
of course i don't have c drive on mac so you'll go to my computers and go to c drive and then in c drive you will just create a folder create or yes create a new folder and then just name it sqlite so in windows you should have three files when you download it here is showing two files i have a screenshot let me try to find it there you go so it is going to look something like this there will be three options you're in your c drive right here oops c drive here and then if you don't have that folder create a folder called sqlite so when you are extracting or unzipping if you create the folder and it will extract everything for you in that folder so for double click on sqlite 3 file it should open in the command line and you should see something similar to my screen here so it will basically open up a command prompt for you with similar options so now that you have sqlite dv installed sqlite does not have any GUI, so we don't have the touch and look feeling right instead of using command line for managing databases we'll use a gui tool there are many gui tools out there but i'm going to use one called cq light studio it's free and support cross platform with the tool we can create and manage databases let's head over to google again this time i'm going to search for cq light studio and here is the the first link click on it i have already downloaded it so just click on download and select your location where you want to save it and that should do it so i'm going to bring back my terminal just typing sqlite 3 we can start the process just typing dot quit we can just exit out or quit the service so now that we have sqlite and sqlite studio so i'm going to open up sqlite here open that's bring me to this screen here i'll show you how to add a new database since we don't have any database first thing is you can click here where is you see this uh, plus icon here and sqlite 3 is already selected for you here i'm going to so for the first time we'll need to create a database file so i'm going to actually have it in desktop and i'm going to name it our test db.db save it that's fine and i'm going to test my connection if you see this green check mark that means that it's okay if not at times it gives you error meaning here actually choosing the location so if you have something existing you can actually go there and then find it but if you're having issue just go to desktop or go to a location and then just create a new file and then go from there i'm going to select okay so now we have our database first database name our test db now there are few ways we can insert data into into the database of course the easiest way to kind of use the query tool and write some commands and then it takes care of everything for us right but for our learning purposes i'm going to kind of show you guys both ways so here we have our first database now double click here this will give you this view here so we're going to tables click on this create table icon here a table name so you can name anything i'm going to name it as uh, kiwi engineers here we can add columns so here is it is add a column so this column name i'll say emp or eid employee id right data type there will be numbers so integer i'm not going to specify any size but if you want to you can and this is will be our primary key so what is a primary key primary key is something unique so relational databases as it says right there are some relations so within the tables when you're coring you need to have some kind of relation meaning something unique so you can connect or you can pull or you can query and display data and retrieve data from the database for example we shop in many websites right so if you shop in amazon and there was some issue you call their customer service or email them and they say okay what is your customer id so they might have a uh, one table where all the customer information is there such as customer name phone number so all kind of address and so on and then they might have another table called orders 
and where they store all the orders. So there, so the information is in a separate table, right? And they might have another table for other information. So if we have a primary key, that's how we can link or you know kind of identify the customer and then retrieve the information. Here I'm going to say unique, and then I'm just going to click OK, and then click on this green check mark, and this is going to kind of show you what we are trying to do. Let me press OK. So here it was successfully created. So now we need to go to the data tab here, and we can insert data for that column we just created. So here you click here, insert rows. So you see that we have a column called EID, but there's nothing there. So I'm going to give it some kind of identification, right? Customer ID one, two, three. And then click the check mark, click on the check mark here. So that should do it actually. And if you can check it, if you go here, select it, expand it, Q engineers, there's one column. So now I'm going to add some more columns. The second one I'll uh, name of the employee, right? And data type here would be virtual. Here I'm not going to give any size here. I'm just going to select unique and then click OK. Then I'm going to create another column name title. This one is virtual again. I'm going to create another column name salary. This is going to be a integer unique. Click OK. Trying to make it larger so I can view it so you can just expand it. So here the second one name if I go to data. Of course I need to actually commit these changes I made. So I'm going to select don't show again. Okay. So it's inserted. Now I'm going to go to data. Here you can see that all the columns are displaying. So we can just insert name would be Anib title, let's say junior QA, Q analyst. Salary, I'm going to say let's say 70, 49,000 US dollars. And then I'm going to commit the change here by clicking the check mark, spend it here. So, how can you check it if you have inserted the data? You can run simple queries and check if our data was inserted correctly. So, top of the bar here, try to hover over. You might have a different icon, it you know, over time they change the icon. So, here says open sql and editor so if you don't if it's not displaying for you click on these arrows and there's more options there so it might be hiding somewhere there so for me it's here i clicked on it so select all from our table name so our table name is qa engineers and click on this bluish icon here and it just displayed as the information here so eid the information we have provided earlier or inserted into the database earlier. So I'm going to create another table, but this time we're going to use this query tool to kind of insert data into the database. How to do that? You can, uh, there's, there are a lot of good tutorials out there, but you can also follow the W3Schools website I showed you guys earlier. The one simple way to insert data is you follow this pattern here. So first we're going to create a table named work history. So create table, square brackets, name of your table, work history, close the square bracket, open up parentheses, then we're going to give the column name. So here I'm going to say, let me do it in a second line, then open up another square bracket, employee ID, go to close, close it, the type, integer, we're doing the same thing, but we're kind of typing in right now, right? And then I'm going to say not now, and it is primary comma here for the next line. I'm going to add another column name free. Let's do lowercase p v i previous. Close the bracket. Say virtual. Let's do uppercase it's null, and we're going to close the parentheses we opened earlier and semicolon. That should do it. So click on the run command again and query finished. So as you can see on left hand side, it just created a new table called work history and uh, two columns here. Isn't that awesome? So we need to insert some data now, right? So what I'm going to do, clear this up. So the insert data, insert into our table name is work history. I'm going to open up parentheses. 
then the column name is employee ID, right? Comma, you have a previous company. If you want to just insert data into a single column, you can do that as well. So go to the next line here, type in values, open parentheses, one, two, three, which is the employee ID, and the previous company is uh, ABC form. So for text or virtual, when you're typing, use single quotation or integer we don't have to use anything we can just leave it as is close the parentheses and semicolon here and let's try to insert our data click on this and it says that one row affected right so how can we verify it again so we're going to run the previous command we had so select all from this time this is work table right or work history table so if i run it oh, okay typo here select all from work history here you go this is our data here right this is a very handy and cool feature to query into the database and display data for example let's say if a company if a company if there are 10,000 employees right right now it would just have one employee or few tables it's easier we can just kind of go in there and see and select and insert but if there are 10 15,000 employees and every day or every week new hiring is taking place you know and uh, hundreds of employees are joining and you have to insert their data update their data employees are leaving and so on sick leave vacation and so many other things right so we have to you know so we can use the Query tool to retrieve data. I'm just showing you very simple select statement, but you can select it by let's say which department they work, right? We can have another column called departments. So I want you to actually go to W3 Skill Schools, go to SQL, insert more columns, more rows, and try to practicing some of these commands here. You know, mostly you're going to use uh, like min max if you want to see some kind of average, pound sum, and so on. You can use wildcards and joints. You know, let's say if you want to retrieve data from two, three tables, two or more table, tables, you know, you can do that. I do not want to go too much in details on some of the topics I'm covering in this course. My goal is to walk you through the basics and go from there. Since this series is combined with all the skills you need to get into IT field, you need to know the basics first. Plus, it will be over information overload for you if you want to just do too much. First, whatever you are learning here, you need to get comfortable with it and then move on to the advanced stuff. That's it for database and SQL series. Hope this is going to benefit you guys on to the next topic unix linux linux and unix are both types of operating systems linux is a copy of the unix operating system which is over time has developed into a different os unix is an operating system commonly used in internet servers workstations and pcs linux is an open source free to use operating system widely used for computer hardware and software game development tablet pcs mainframes etc there are many linux distributions distributions or distros are more of different versions here are some popular linux distros ubuntu linux mint sent os is a free version of red hat and of course the commercial enterprise version red hat ubuntu is a computer operating system based on the debian linux distribution and distributed as free and open source software it has its own desktop environment. Ubuntu is one of the famous or most used Linux distribution. Now, why am I showing you Linux? Most of the servers running in the world are Linux based. As a QA, at times, you might need to look into some logs to figure out what's causing an issue within the application. Another good reason because cloud computing is becoming more dominant, such as AWS, Azure, GCP, it is a good time to start now and build up your Linux skills. DevOps engineers, system admins are in high demand and these roles require decent Linux skills. You can practice Linux commands following ways. If you have a Mac, you are in luck. Mac OS is based on Unix operating system. Just open up the terminal and practice. 
for Windows, there are good news for Windows 10 users as well. On Windows 10, Ubuntu can be installed from the Microsoft Store. Or if you don't want to go through that for now, you can use web-based GUI terminals such as copy.sh webmenial. There are many other online terminals. Just Google for it and find the one you like. I'm going to open up my browser, search for online Linux terminal. As you can see, there are all different list of terminals you can use. I'm going to click on this one. Click on run terminal now. It's going to take a few seconds to load. So we're ready to go here. First, let's check which directory you are in. To do that, you can just type in pwd. So I'm in my home slash user. So with pwd, you can display your current working directory. With ls command, you can list contents of directory. So I'm going to actually go back to my terminal, Mac terminal here. I just want to quickly show you how to open up a web-based GUI terminal. So here I'm on my desktop and I'm going to do ls. That kind of shows what I have in that directory. I can also create a new directory using the mkdir command and name of the directory. So I'm going to say Linux practice 101. Press enter. You can use ls to kind of see if that was successfully created right here. I'm going to use clear command to clear my screen and then do ls again. And I want to go to that directory. How do you do that? CD command, you can go to a particular directory and then and I'm going to type in few words and use the tab key that will autofill it for me and then press enter. So let's see if you want to go back to the previous directory, you can do CD dot dot that will take you one directory back and PWD, you are in users Bismillah desktop, right? So I want to go back to my Linux practice cd there now if we look at the directory i do not have anything it's empty right now right so i want to create a file there how to do that you can use a command called touch and the file name so i'm going to say practice enter so we can also look at content of the file we can use a command called cat and the file name so if we do cat practice there's nothing there so let's insert some or add some information in our file in order to do that you can use uh, various visual text editor you can use nano i'm used to using vi so i'm going to say vi then file name it will open it up so vi kind of works in different modes so i need to go to insert mode pr uh, by pressing I. then i'm going to say this is our first linux practice and press escape save it wq press enter then it goes back to my terminal then now if i do cat i can type it again or just use your up arrow and if you do it few times then it will show you the the last command you used press enter now you can see that our terminal is displaying what we added in our file now we're going to look at few other commands you can use the grape command to search a file for a pattern you can also use the man command to find more information and date command to display the date and cal command to display the calendar if you want to look at the history process command in history basically history list you can just type history it will kind of show you all the commands you used you can use who command to see who is on the system so we are in our linux practice folder you can remove the file by remove and file name so practice if you do ls again that file is gone you can also delete the directory so i'll go back to one directory back cd dot dot and do ls here and then it will show us the list of the directories i have then i'm going to to remove dir and then linux practice and it should be gone by now and you can use ls a to look at the hidden files you can also use ls minus l to get detailed information about the different access and so on why mobile testing is important do i really have to explain why mobile testing is important what are we going to do without mobile or devices that explains itself mobile technology and smart devices are part of our daily life 
mobile application users do not like faulty or slow applications instead they delete and get a replacement app for some reason we do not have enough patience with faulty apps perhaps our expectation is higher and people want quick and seamless access many companies they realize that and that's why they're focusing so much on mobile testing and it, it became a very important and of course there are so much competition and there are so many similar apps types of mobile device testing device is a broader term handsets tablets connected devices such as xbox they fall under devices for future reference i'm going to use the term device for mobile as well we can say it individually mobile testing or handset testing or tablets or connected devices or we can just say device testing device testing falls into two categories hardware testing and software application testing simply app testing so for hardware testing uh, the testing includes processors hardware memory screen sizes wi-fi resolution camera and so on our focus will be software app testing in other videos, I'm going to explain more about app testing. For this video, app testing is to test the functionalities of the application on devices. And there are three types of app testing, web app, native app, and hybrid app. Challenges of mobile or device testing. This is an interview question as well. Testing applications on device is more challenging than testing web app. Different range of mobile devices with different screen sizes and hardware. Wide varieties of mobile devices like Apple, LG, HTC, Samsung, Nokia. Different mobile operating systems like Android, Windows, iOS, Blackberry. Different versions of operating system. Frequent updates. Different mobile network operators. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.